do ask people to please mute themselves on your end. Um, when we get to the close of the session, uh, Dr. Wilson will take your questions and will listen for suggestions, ideas, um, and anything that might be on anyone's mind. So let me go ahead and introduce our facilitator. Dr. Jody Wilson is the CEO and Director of Business Psychology Solutions, a consulting firm in Southeast Washington State. She is a behavioral scientist, instructor, coach, and presenter. She holds a PhD in business psychology, and she specializes in serving individuals and organizations. Her clients range from small family-owned businesses to Fortune 500 companies. With 20 years of experience tapping into unseen people's strengths and developing strategies to optimize organizational talent and leadership, Dr. Wilson uses behavioral science to help transform organizations. She has numerous research projects to her credit, both qualitative and quantitative. Her knowledge and experiences relate to cognitive biases, talent management, and coaching, and they directly impact her work in the critical areas of performance, leadership, and team building. Currently, she's an adjunct professor at Columbia Basin College in Richland, Washington. She teaches at South Puget Sound Community College, and she's an instructor at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. She just recently returned from professional engagements in Germany, and I remember that she told me yesterday that one of them was Frankfurt, but I forget the other city. So I'll let her tell you um, where she's been spending her time. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Jody Wilson. Thank you, Steve. It's great to be back. I really enjoy coming in and speaking to you. Um, it's always a joy to come and talk to you guys. Got back from um, Germany and I was speaking in Frankfurt and in Stuttgart. I've had the pleasure now to have spoken um, in Germany with those same audiences twice now in the last year. So it's definitely been fun. It's also been good to get some of that multicultural perspective that allows me to grow and to learn, you know, what makes us similar as humans, but what also impacts us um, throughout culture and and helps us have some differences too. So without <clears throat> further ado, we will start talking about candor. So when we look at candor <clears throat> and we think about employee engagement, one of the pieces to understand is how candor can actually help increase engagement versus decreasing it. I think uh, historically, we've gotten to a place where candor kind of gets a bad rap. And we tend to focus on candor being more about giving negative information than it is about giving positive information. So when we look at the true definition of candor, it's really about openly expressing ourselves and about being frank. Now, frank doesn't mean yeah. harsh. Frank doesn't mean abrasive. Frank just means that you're essentially kind of cutting to the chase, right? Is your phone getting louder than that? Yeah, I can. Oh. Is everybody hearing me? Let's do a quick sound check. We good? Jody, um, I'm having difficulty hearing you. Okay. Thank you. Is that better or do you want the headset? I think the headset might be better. Okay. I agree. I'm having difficulties hearing you as well. All right. Are we better now? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Oh, much better. Thank you. Okay. So when we're looking at candor, we need to understand that candor is really about frankness. And some of that can be frankness in the ability to um, speak thoroughly rather than giving a lot of embellishments. It can also mean being frank in our um, delivery style, but frank really doesn't mean being abrasive or being brash or being harsh with people. It means that we are openly expressing ourselves and that's not necessarily just on the negative feedback side, it actually can be towards the positive feedback side. So we have this tendency to really pigeonhole what candor means and give it some negative connotations when truthfully it covers an entire breadth of communication. When we are 
using candor, candor also helps us by gathering other perspectives. When we are in work situations and we're only listening to one perspective, which sometimes is our own, um, that actually kind of hurts us. It hurts us in our ability to understand and get a perspective on what is happening within an entire team, what's happening within an entire organization. And we need, especially in problem solving, we need to have other perspectives and get open, frank feedback from other individuals so that we can make more effective decisions. When we're looking at candor, we're also looking at the ability to keep things very real. So when people have a tendency to be either overly positive or overly negative, when we embed candor into our communication, it brings us back to center and allows us to see both the positive and the negative with a level of realism. It also allows for additional information gathering, which as we're moving through into more complex work systems <clears throat> is going to be necessary. We need to keep gathering information from people and they need to know that they can come to us and that in coming to us that there will be an active communication dialogue versus a I need to tell you what you want to hear type dialogue or a it's not going to matter what I say in this situation they've already made up their mind type dialogue or a situation where the person or the work group feels as though they're completely shut down. So when we're looking at this from that engagement perspective, when we're using candor, we're actually engaging people on a regular basis. We're actually saying, hey, I want to hear from you. I want to know your input. I want to know your perspective. That increases our engagement versus expecting people to, you know, simply sit at their desk and tell us what, they, what we want to hear. That doesn't add value to the overall function of an organization. Now, in order to use candor, we really have to set the stage. So you have to really permit candor in your work group in order for it to work. And one of the pieces of permitting candor is setting the stage to say, you know what, I really do want to hear from you. I really do want to create a dialogue of communication that allows me to get your perspective and for you to also engage in feedback from me. And the feedback can be about where are the growing points with people? Where are the points where processes within the work group or within the organization need to be adjusted or adapted? Where are the places that people are doing really good? You know, where are those positive components, not just the negative pieces? So where do we and how do we set up the culture of the work group or the organization to have this open feedback that allows people to come to either their manager or their manager to go to them? Because we're really looking for a reciprocal dialogue, not a one-way dialogue. When we're looking at candor, we also want to consider how we are using timing in our delivery of candor. When we lead, there's always a context, right? So there's a context for us as leaders and there's a context for employees. There's a context within the work that they're doing as much as there's a context within the work that we are doing. So looking at timing, we have to consider things like location. Is it best to give any kind of feedback or gather feedback in a situation that is a group oriented situation or is it better to get feedback from an individual do a one-on-one -on -one conversation send out a survey is it best to create um, more of a place where people have indirect communication or is it a place to have direct communication personally i find that when you have multiple avenues for communication you actually have a better um, platform and a better culture for candor. So there are people who will want to take the time to engage one-on-one. -on -one. There are people who will want to take the time to engage through a survey. And there are people who will want to take time to engage through group dynamics. All three of those 
need to be cultivated in order to allow candor to be part of your engagement process. So it's not really a let's check this one box and just call it good. We're really looking for how do we create a full system that says, you know what, whatever is best for you, we're going to adapt and we're going to create that opening for all of the employees and all of the leaders. When we're looking at setting the stage, one of the key components with really engaging in candor is getting permission. So taking the time to get permission from the person to be candid. Now, once again, this is a two-way street. So when we're looking at candor, it's not just about me as the leader getting permission from my employee to be candid with them. It's also about them getting permission from me to be candid back. Um, I've worked in a lot of different places and my work history, I've been um, named as the person who you go to if you really wanna know the answer. So candor has never been something that I've had an issue having. The issue that I have had in work groups is that I have had a tendency to really have to learn when to not be candid. So specifically, I was in one work group where um, one of my colleagues was saying, you know, that Jody, she's really quiet. And there was another woman who was on the team and she's like, no, she's not. Just go ask her. If you ask her, she'll tell you. But if you don't ask her, she won't tell you. That was how I had adapted to candor, into using candor. There are different times that I have used it in, in team meetings that have been appropriate as far as idea sharing. You know, it's okay to be candid in idea sharing when you have that kind of culture that supports it. The other piece is I've also had timing, times where I have not. Um, I've stepped into being candid when it wasn't appropriate. I've also learned to ask permission. I've also learned that in asking permission, some people will say yes when they mean no. And you also have to work through those processes with people too. But really setting up that, that piece that says, okay, I want your permission to be candid and I want to give you my permission to be candid too. That is one of the foundations for incorporating candor into your work groups. Now, in order to really get permission, you have to have trust. Trust is one of the fundamental elements in creating an engagement process. I was just um, watching a talk by Josh Bernson, who is one of the top um, consultants in HR, and he was talking about how trust is a fundamental element for any kind of engagement process with employees. If you have a organization where there is not enough trust, you're not gonna have candor. Your employees aren't gonna come to you and tell you when a project is derailing, when something is going completely south, unless they absolutely have to. Some of that may be related to their own fear or desire not to create conflict, but other pieces of it really come to trust. Do they trust you that they can come to you and say, look, I've run into a problem, I think I can have it fixed by the end of the day, but I can't guarantee it. That's the ability to use candor. There are other places where organizations are so shut down in their candor process that employees feel like they don't have the opportunity to really go to a supervisor, a manager, a leader and say, you know what, something's going wrong here and I don't know if I can get it fixed by the end of the day or within two weeks. You know, sometimes things happen that actually evolve over time versus the immediacy. When we are looking at building trust, trust also takes down the complexity of interpersonal uh, communication. So when you are looking at candor and using candor as a way to build trust or to reflect the trust that you already have in a work group, it's really important that you understand that that becomes a litmus test for people as they are engaging in work. So when we're really looking at the higher amounts of trust we have, the lower complexity we have interpersonally in an organization, that helps our work 
get done in a more efficient way, but it helps us feel good about the work that we're doing. So when we have high trust, we know that what we're doing is valued, that the work that we perform has a level of quality to it, that we are engaged, that we are also meeting the needs of the organization and also meeting our own personal needs of feeling like we've really mastered something. Trust also gives us the ability to feel like we belong to the work group. Now, individual contributors will also really want to build trust. Their sense of belonging may look a little different. So rather than wanting to belong to the entire team, they may want to belong more on that individual level with people versus the entire group level. When we are building trust, we also have to recognize that trust is happening both as the, de the deliverer, as the communicator, and as the listener. So really cultivating both perspectives and knowing that we need to be building that trust and working through trust from both sides of the communication process. Now, we kind of touched on timing a little bit, but one of my favorite examples about timing is really the Disney strategy. Um, typically in a live audience, I would be like, who, who's heard of the Disney strategy? So here's what happened. After Walt Disney passed away, they went through and did some research and said, what were the pieces and what were the things that Disney did that made him so successful? And one of the, the elements that they found in the research was what they refer to as the Disney strategy. In the Disney strategy, you have three different distinct components. So you have, when you're working, the dreamer. The dreamer is where you're doing your brainstorming, where you're creating ideas, where you're really developing a lot of content or a lot of processes, things that really are coming from that more creative sense. For Disney, he didn't want to disrupt that creative process. So there were very distinct rules. And those rules were that you were allowed to create in an open format. So when you were in creation mode, there was no critiquing. There was no, how is this going to work? It was strictly go in and create. So he allowed that process to really hold and to build from a creation standpoint until it was time to actually move it from idea to the realist perspective. So the second perspective is the realist. The realist is the one who says, okay, <clears throat> so you've got a great idea here. Now, how exactly are we going to get this idea from that piece of paper into, in this case, a movie form? And the realist would come in and say, well, we need X, Y, Z. We need, you know, video clips. We need animation. We need multiple movements of this little mouse, right? So that was the realist. The realist came in and said, what's step one, what's step two, what's step three? There was a time to move into that, but it didn't happen until after the dreamer section was completely ready to move into the, the, the realist perspective. Now, you can't just have a dreamer and a realist. You have to have a critic. And the critic was actually a very small section of the process. And the critic is the place where candor actually comes into play, right? The critic was the one who said, okay, the process is a little off here. So let's go back and let's look at these details. This is not working. How do we add this in? Or, hey, we've got some, you know, some T's to dot here. Quality control. Think of them. They're the critic, right? They're the ones who are saying, okay, you've gotten us to this point. Now, how do we make it even further? How do we polish it? Candor comes into play there as well as with the realist. But you're really looking at how do you explain to somebody in a very frank way that they need to add an additional component, that they need to go through and polish a, a, an element before it can come into the, in this case, the visual scene. And, in the movies. So 
for Disney, there were these very three, very distinct three processes that people went through in order to develop a final product. We need to really still be looking at how does candor and timing come into play with these, recognizing specifically in a meeting, okay, we've got people doing some brainstorming, we've got a process, we have something that, ne that needs a solution. So you do need your dreamer and you need your dreamers to be willing to vocalize themselves and that does take candor too. They have to know that it's safe to be able to be candid, that it's safe to give out their creative ideas. They have to know that they are, that their ideas are welcomed by the group and wanted. So when we look at the, the realist, you know, a disgruntled realist may be like, yeah, go figure this out yourself. I'm not really into it, you know? But you really want to engage the realist and have the realist welcome in the situation and doing the whole, okay, so I'm not seeing how we're going to get this mouse and this dog to turn into a full animation process. I'm missing some co components. Well, then you can turn it back to the dreamer who can say, okay, well, maybe we need to add a car. Maybe that's how they get from, you know, the, the house over to the fire station. You keep adding to by adding the candor to the conversation and then moving it into the critic where it ends up being in the spot where people have the opportunity to really go through and get into the nitty gritty of the situation and knowing when the timing is of that. So you don't wanna be a critic too early in the situation, right? You want to have people have the ability to step into that dreaming element. And you also don't wanna be the critic prior to the realism coming in you really want to hold that position until it's time for it. So like what you're talking about is reviewing, document reviews, right? When we're going through looking at processes, have we hit the element with the critic where the critic says, okay, you've got a process over here and a process over here, but do you realize these two actually intersect and one is, at, is undermining the other? So you, you're creating a log jam. That's important. That's another example of candor. Can I frankly say, we've got two processes that have now created a competing and conflictual um, workflow jam, and how are we going to address that? So, when we're looking at candor, we also have to look at how do we move from being in those three different components, the dreamer, the realist, and the critic, and how do we start looking at asking questions? You know, one of the ways that I have found over time that we can really be candid with people is to ask a question. Because sometimes a question actually gives us more information than making a statement. And it can be a, a form of reflective feedback. So when we throw out questions to people that allow us to develop and probe and get further in a into information seeking, information gathering, that element really helps us figure out what's going on. And sometimes it saves us from actually delivering a really negative message. So when we're looking at the creating a well-formed question, it, there really is an art to it. When you're communicating with people, it's a matter of going into probing questions, asking for information on that deeper level. So examples of it would be, you know, what would happen if we left these two competing processes as they are? What would happen if we ran into a situation where neither of these processes worked? Getting to those questions that ask, the, ask for a deeper level of understanding give us the ability to candidly look at a situation and look at a potential problem without saying to someone, well, you know, I think you're a bit short-sighted here. I, I don't think you have it all. No, you're wrong. I, I think that we need to go over here and do blah, 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 right? That the messaging is very different, but it creates that open dialogue by saying, you know, what if the opposite in this situation were true? 
So we have these two processes and we know that at some point in time, they actually bump up against each other. But what would happen if we flipped it and created a situation where the one process actually flowed into not competed with the other? Those pieces allow for candor to say, you know, we would probably need to change this and this in the dynamic, or we would need to do a walkthrough that showed how we were getting from process one to process two. Getting those pieces of candor into the conversation versus the whole, well, you're the boss, you decide, or the, well, that's not in my pay grade. I'm not going to contribute to that conversation. We've all been in places and seeing people have some of those attitudes and respond in communication that way. Those aren't the healthy aspects of candor. The healthy aspects are the ones where we're really allowing and getting to that deeper level of exploring, of adding that creative response to it, of coming up with solutions. You know, when we're going through and evaluating how to ask questions, we also have to really consider what, what happens for people when we look at being honest with them. So moving on, whoop, I'm out of order. <laughs> so communication provides an opportunity to disrupt the pattern and disrupted patterns create opportunities for new choices and new group dynamics to occur. When we're looking at using the the questions. We're looking at creating a new dynamic. We're looking at how do we break the old dynamic that says, you know what, I, I don't want to contribute to this conversation. You're the boss. You decide. You're the smart one here. I mean, you get those attitudes. When you break that up by asking the probing questions, you find that the communication dialogue and you find that the engagement from employees actually increases because now they have a reason to engage. They're being told through questions that their information and what they are wanting to contribute is actually valued and appreciated. So here's one of the tricky ones, right? Everyone loves the honest person until the honest person strikes a chord with a the truth they weren't ready to receive. When we communicate and when we use candor, there's two different ways that we can go about communicating. One of them is to use what I refer to in coaching as front door strategies. There are people who will specifically want you to just tell them, just give me the feedback, just let me know. There are other people who would rather that you send them the message in an indirect way and that typically revolves around kind of this idea of you go plant the seed and then you walk away. A lot of times the probing questions will help you with the person who wants to do more of an indirect route. So on an indirect route, when somebody is not willing to take direct feedback, that's where you use some of those questions to say, you know, I'm really confused on how this process connects to the next process. I'm not seeing it. Is there a way that you could create a plan or a document or a, a graphic for me that shows me how this works? And then you let them go. That is an indirect way of basically saying, you know what, I don't have enough information here. Now, a direct feedback person will be like, hey, I'm okay if you tell me you don't have enough information. It doesn't bother me to hear that. So if you don't have enough information and I'm a direct person and I can say, hey, okay, you don't have enough information, so where do you know where the hole is? Can you tell me what you understand from the development of the first process and where, where you're understanding the development of the second process? Direct people will be okay with engaging in that kind of dialogue. Indirect individuals, it's better to kind of throw the, pro the probing question out, let them go and come up with the solution, and then come back to them and say, you know, once again, if you could create a graphic for me, I, would, I think that would help me understand where we're going. That also helps 
to keep the dialogue going with them because you can come back to them and say, you know, I really would like it if you could have this dialogue or you could have this, if we could come back and talk about this again on Friday. Would Friday give you enough time to kind of create a workflow document? Would it give you enough time to create a graphic? That gives them the ability to, to slide in the situation. A direct person may be like, nope, that wasn't what I was thinking. I was thinking that we could go from this, this junction at process A and then that it would connect and they can give you that whole plan right there on the spot. So it's really about working with the dynamics of your team and knowing who can handle and can, can do the whole thinking and speaking on the fly and who can handle you being very honest with them in that moment. So when you are looking at um, these situations, it's also important once again to ask for permission. So even if you have a direct person who's accepting of feedback that says, you know what, I'm not getting it. It's okay to look at them and say, you know, can I give you some feedback? Would you mind if I pointed out a spot where I'm not understanding what you're talking about? Getting that permission, once again, gives them the ability to say, oh, you actually want more from me. It's not that you're telling me that what I'm doing is wrong, it's that you really want more. There's a difference in the messaging for people, and it's really important to, once again, bridge that gap. So, moving on to communication tips. When we're looking at communicating, try to also give feedback with the idea that you are helping somebody. So, we don't want to gaslight. We don't want to sit there and kind of create this smoke and mirrors effect that says, oh, I'm really trying to help you, but then there's a double message of how they're hurting somebody. We really want to explain to them, look, I see that you are onto something in the engagement. I see that you are onto something and that you can, you can see there's a hole, something that we're missing, but I'm not getting it yet. So can you help me understand? When you do that, then they feel like they can engage more and it's not so much of a, well, you're wrong or you're paying attention to the wrong information or a message of, well, if you can't tell me, you know, what I want, what I need to hear in one specific, you know, interaction, if you don't have it all together, then why should I listen to you? You have to really engage people and let them know that your idea of communicating is about engaging and helping them help you. Assume positive intentions. Um, I see in work groups multiple times, over and over, people will assume that someone is just trying to interrupt the process. They will think that somebody is just trying to essentially throw a wrench in the entire um, project. And that's not necessarily the truth. Typically, when somebody is trying to give you feedback, and a lot of times when they're trying to give candid feedback, they have a positive intention of also helping you. So recognizing what is their positive intention in this? Are they trying to stop us from essentially spending an extra million dollars that we don't need to spend? Are they trying to help us um, get rid of a glitch before we run into the actual problem. Can they see it coming? Or is it a situation where I need to also assume a positive intention from myself and say, okay, they're trying to help me. Now, how do I try and help them? Keeping in that dynamic process is really, really important. Timing, once again, is everything. So, you know, <laughs> The, the classic example is, are you going to take a really important message to people on a Friday at 4 o'clock? Or are you going to figure out when the best time is to present the, the information to someone? So it's an element of recognizing when is it appropriate, where is it appropriate, who is it appropriate to talk to, is this something that happens on the group format, is this something that we talk about on a Friday because it's an emergent issue, or is it something that's better to wait until a Monday? Is it better to wait until a Tuesday? Figuring out that timing is really important also. Uh, my, 
my husband recently brought this up. There's a place that he works at and he's like, Jody, he goes, I don't understand this, but they make every job offer in the afternoon on a Thursday before a three day weekend. <laughs> and it's a matter once again of timing. Are there other ways? What else is happening in the process that keeps people from getting those offers on Mondays or Wednesdays? Is it just a faulty perception piece on his part where he thinks they only do this on Thursdays at four o'clock? So there's communication. Going slowly, remember communication is a process, not an event. I had the, the wonderful honor of presenting this presentation on candor in um, Portland. And one of the audience members said to me, he was like, well, I don't have time to do process communication. I only have time to tell them once. All right, so if you only tell somebody something once, how does that work? Because my experience, now I'll take it outside of a work, a work format, most husbands and wives have the same conversation over and over and over, sometimes for decades. So that one and done conversation piece, yeah, it doesn't work so well. I've noticed that people with children have a tendency with those kids to also have the same conversation over and over. It's not a one and done. When we're looking at people and humans in general, we don't typically have these one and done kind of interactions. There is actually a word for a one and done kind of interaction, and that's called trauma. And that's not what we're looking for in a work situation. So really and honestly understanding that communication is a process, it's not an event. If you think that you can only have a conversation with somebody one time and that that should fix an entire process, it's not realistic. Now, you know, even if you're looking at changing out badging systems, the communication process for changing out a badging system in, in an organization is more than a one and done kind of situation. They don't strictly give you one communication about it and say, yep, we're good. You got to figure out how to change your badge around now. It doesn't, any change process we know takes repeated, um, persistent, and direct communication. It's that way in work groups also. So one of the things to come back and look at when we're looking at the probing questions is that when we're asking those questions in a probing way, we're also soliciting solutions from people. And when we're adding candor into our organizations and into our engagement, soliciting a solution from somebody, from somebody in the work group actually helps them feel productive. It helps them feel like they're welcomed. It helps them feel like they've mastered something and that they belong. So those elements really fundamentally engage the solution process and engage employees. The other piece is if you go to somebody and say, hey, I need a solution and I think that you can provide it for me, or you go to the group and you say, what's the potential solution here? and let them come with it, that also re-engages the element of trust. It shows your team, hey, I trust you guys to come up with a solution. I trust that you guys have the, or gals, have the, the knowledge, the skill set. You have the information that's needed. And if you don't, that you're willing to go out and get what you need in order to accomplish the solution for this dilemma. All right, here's another fun one. This goes back to timing. Group, group confrontation may not get you the outcome you are looking for. Now, after the dot, dot, dot comes the, unless you're looking for another job. So yeah, I have seen it where group confrontations have led to people getting um, escorted into HR and then there being more drama and more um, consequences for the action of doing a group com confrontation. Be careful and know the timing. When you're looking at a probing question, when you're looking at eliciting a solution, yeah, bring that to the group. When you're looking at giving somebody direct feedback, that's probably better one-on-one. -on -one. Pull it off to the side and communicate with them in a direct, 
and, and comfortable way. So it's that aspect of knowing the timing of is group appropriate or is one-on-one -on -one appropriate. When you bring somebody in one-on-one -on -one specifically, I was consulting in an area where there was a gentleman who in meetings would, <laughs> he was lovely, he would roll his eyes and he'd be sitting in meetings doing this. He would also, <sighs> whenever somebody said something he didn't agree with. Now, that's not appropriate for behavior in a group. It also was diminishing other people's ability to, to give out candid communication. They were being shut down in their expression. The leader or the manager of the root group needed to pull the person aside and do some coaching and say, you know what? There's some things that I'm noticing in our group meetings that I think are are disturbing the group. So I know that some of the communication you may not agree with, and I respect that you don't agree with it. Could we find another way for you to communicate that to the group? Could we find another way for you to be able to um, come back and say what your thoughts are after people are saying what their thoughts are? I've also had to, in coaching people, I've also had to teach them how to politely excuse themselves if they have become too upset to hear something that somebody else is saying, or they're too disrespectful to hear what other people are saying. So you have to figure out ways to really, in that one-on-one -on -one communication, create those growth points for people that can candidly say, you know, this becomes a disruption when you are making vocalizations in this case um, that are telling other people that their ideas aren't welcome or wanted. So it's really about giving people that growing feedback too. Cultures change slowly. So even if they have an aha moment, the culture changes slowly over time. Learning to build the culture of a team, learning to build the culture of an organization, takes time, it takes effort, it takes planning, and it takes strategy. So you really have to be willing to take that element and look at it from the perspective of how do I, how do I create what it is that I really want out of this group? How do I give them the sense that they can trust, that they can bring to, to the group different ideas, different aspects, different components that we don't usually hear? How do I start making room for that? How do I start giving them permission? Sometimes it comes down to repeatedly letting them know that they do have permission, and that has to come both in words and in actions. So leaning in, when you're the one who's really wanting to include candor, you have to learn to self-monitor first. Recognizing what is going on with you when you are asking for feedback and when you are asking for other people to be candid with you is that element of recognizing, okay, I've said it verbally, but now am I, what am I saying non-verbally? Non-verbally, am I telling them that I really do want to hear this? The other piece, watch taking feedback personally. Sometimes we have a tendency to get very defensive when somebody gives us feedback. It's really for our growth. Coming at and looking at feedback as though it is an opportunity to grow and learn is the healthiest place that we can come to from, come at it from. So feedback really is about being a part of this continual dialogue rather than it being a, well, they told me I did this wrong. Okay, what they actually said was, you know, in when we're in the work group, I would really like to hear more of your ideas. You have a tendency to bring them to me individually, and I like them. I just feel like I would like there to be an opportunity for you to also say it in the group. Recognizing that somebody may have a hard time saying it in the group is one piece. The other piece is that you really aren't telling them, hey, I don't wanna hear it. You're telling them, I want to hear it, and I want everyone else to hear it. That's how you work on dialogues that, that are more expanding versus diminishing. We're gonna go back and assume positive attentions. 
and ignite growth mindsets. So listening, when we are in a candid and creating a candid community and a candid culture, we have to learn to listen. And one of the pieces to listening is that we have to sit and be willing to engage with the person. There's a classic story when Bernie Madoff was doing the Ponzi scheme. There was a gentleman who went to the regulatory commissions and said, something's wrong here. I can tell you something is wrong. Well, okay. Bernie got caught, went to jail. A lot of people lost fortunes. It was a complete mess and it was devastating. Now, the, when it came out that there was a gentleman who came to the regulatory commissions and said, something's wrong. He's doing a Ponzi scheme. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. They were like, well, he didn't say it in a way that we could hear it. Okay, wait. Like it, the reports even went to a point of saying that he had a, a level of mental illness calling him um, like autistic spectrum. Okay, here's the thing. When you are the listener, you do have a responsibility to also help the communicator communicate with you. So I get and totally respect the need to do the active listening where you're paraphrasing, but I also think that as listeners, we need to, to add to that, not just do the whole, well, what I hear you say is, you need to also say, okay, you know what? I'm hearing that, you're, that you see a problem here, but I'm not getting the picture of how it connects all the way over here. That's how in listening, you are also engaging to gather more information. So in listening, you have to be willing to be a part of the communication process in a way that allows the person to really delve deeper and to know what you don't know. So I run into this multiple times with people that I coach, right? We have people who they're trying to communicate with someone else and the other person is quote unquote listening. Typically it's that they are repeating back or that they are are paying attention. So they've got the attentive, you know, lean in, they're giving somebody a head nod, that kind of listening. But they're not telling the person what they don't understand. And that is also part of communicating and also part of the listening process. You have to let people know where the holes are so that they can fill them in, so that they have an opportunity to explain it a different way. And it is okay to even say to somebody, can you explain this another way? Um, for the Chicago School of um, Professional Psychology, I teach graduate student statistics. You wanna talk about an emotional topic that is actually logical information, but ignites a lot of emotion, try teaching statistics. <laughs> so one of the things that I do is rather than trying to constantly give them other examples that tell them, hey, um, this is how you do this, this, and this with variables. What I have learned is that if I literally move the examples into fruit, if I literally say, okay, our variables are now apples, oranges, pears, and bananas, it takes out this whole other element of fear and helps them create a visual story with the variables so that they can hear the information that I am giving them. But otherwise, they have a tendency to start shutting down. Um, literally, I had one student when we were doing a live online lab, she was sitting there and all of a sudden you heard, I think I could use one of those apples and oranges things again. So that gave me the cue. She wasn't getting it. And so we went through and figured out where the gaps were in the communication. I needed to listen and to hear what it was specifically that she needed from me in order for me to communicate effectively. If she hadn't have come back and said, I need that apples and oranges, Jode, then I wouldn't have known. So as the listener, I needed that direct feedback. Now, one of the other really important pieces when you're looking at feedback is when you're the listener and somebody's telling you something you don't want to hear, take your time with it. Absorb it, think about it, 
do not react, and then come back to the person. So that's where I do the whole hold it for 24 hours, get back to the person the next day. Really consider in that time period the maybes, right? So maybe they have a point here. Maybe they have a point. Maybe they're seeing something that I'm not. Those are the elements that are really important in the feedback process. So honesty has a power that very few people can handle. Recognizing the impact of honesty, recognizing how people respond to honesty is really important because it doesn't always feel good to them. The other piece is that when using candor and when using honesty, when being frank, you can do everything right and still not have the perfect outcome because we're all human, right? So that's part of our element of engaging and interacting with each other is that we can do everything in our power to make it the best possible situation and still not have it turn out perfectly. Uh, I have a colleague right now who has been dealing with a very difficult employee and that's what she's doing. She's doing everything that she can. However, the person on the other end has been allowed to behave in a way for several years in the work environment in a way that is not, it's counterproductive. So they're running into issues where they're having to get HR involved. That's happening and both of them may be doing everything right. The person who is a part of her employment group is like, well, before you showed up, I was allowed to act this way all the time. Why would it need to be any different? And my colleague is like, no, this isn't acceptable for our work groups. We need to be able to communicate at specifically this level. We need to be able to tell people what's going on, share information. When you get into those situations, both people think that they're right, but the outcome is not cohesive for both. We don't get it right every day, right? So sometimes we mess up. Sometimes we say things that we shouldn't say. It's a matter of, in a trusting organization, how do you handle it? How do you say, you know what? I don't think that I did the best job in telling you your, the feedback yesterday. So can I try this again? Can you give me a minute and let me explain a little bit more of what I was thinking? Or can you say, you know what? Yesterday, it was a really bad time when you came into my office. Can we go back and have this conversation again? Because I don't think that I heard everything that I needed to hear from you. I think that I shut, I think that because of timing, I shut the conversation off too quickly. Could we go back and explore some, of more, some more of what you were trying to say? The piece is be resilient. Allow other people to be resilient and recognize that even in our humanity, our ability to be human, sometimes we have to dust ourselves off, try again, and we also have to let people know when we made an error or when we think we could do better. That will also increase and keep the candor and the trust going in the organization. Ultimately, that is where I would like to stop. How is everyone doing? Do we have questions? <clears throat> this is Steve. I'll let to um, open up the um, phone lines here so that people can do that. Um, thank you for what was a great presentation this morning. And we will ask everybody as you're unmuted, uh, please um, keep the background noise to a minimum. Uh, we can hear everybody in the room. <laughs> so we'll ask you to kind of keep quiet and respect uh, the ability of others to step forward and ask questions. Um, while you were chatting, and we'll just give everybody time here, while, while, while you were giving your presentation, I was kind of looking on my other screen at the same subject. And an aspect of this that spoke to the importance of candor in the workplace is more than just um, um, interpersonal, person to person. Uh, it has to do with the flow of information in an organization. Right. And you, um, you can't hoard it. And you have to uh, insist on, it's that trust atmosphere that you talked about. People need to be able to come forward and be candid with what they think they know. And you address that certainly with the Bernie Madoff situation. Right. 
So thank you for that. All right, looks like we've got people unmuted. So um, if anybody has a question and would like to step forward, we would encourage you to do so. This is Marshall with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Uh -huh. I just wanted to make a comment about the um, statement of positive intention. Mm -hmm. I think that one really hit home for me. I think people come in with like a preconceived agenda when they approach communication. Um, and I think the approach really impacts the, the, the uh, delivery. Right. So I think coming with a positive intention and not a hurtful place can really be impactful where the communication leads down a, a better road or a better path. Correct. And in additionally with that, it also is a way that you're showing people that you trust them. So if you say somebody has a positive intention or you, or you come in with everyone having a positive intention attitude, that generally says, I'm going to trust that we're all here for the betterment of our situation. We're right. here for, to better the organization, our work group. We're here with the desire to help each other versus maybe an overly competitive environment or a diminishing environment. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback. I appreciate it. Um, this is Avis. The example that you used for honesty, mm -hmm. in my years of working, that was probably the most difficult time I had being candid and still trying to stay kind. Because it happened, it happened to me six times in the years I was working that there was someone in the group who had been there for a long time and no one had ever been honest enough to explain to her what her attitude, how her attitude was affecting everybody else. And I had a manager who dumped her on me and said, hey, he said, I trust you. I, I know that you're going to be candid and honest with her. Maybe you can straighten her out. And that happened to me six times. Right. The, the other thing about candor is if you get a reputation for being candid, it automatically builds trust because people know that you will be as honest and as open with you with them as they possibly can and they can be likewise with you correct it is it, in order to really cultivate and to really keep the the trust going in an organization you have to have that level of safety that says you know here's what's going on and here's what i see some of the people who are actually um, more prolific or polished with candor have the ability to talk to people who can be very abrasive. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they can have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with people who are abrasive and they can say, you know, here's my concern. My concern is that you have really good ideas, however, how you're delivering those to the group are getting you shut down. And I would really like to see your ideas get implemented. Having candor back that's kind and says, you know what, you have, you're doing some things here that are actually shutting down what your ultimate goal is. And if we can figure out a way to work through that, then it's for the betterment of everyone. That ability to take people who are more abrasive and help them learn to be more kind and candid is also helpful too. So it's a it's a win win in that one. But sometimes it's not easy. No, it's not. And I've had situations where people have looked at me and said, "I don't know how to say this. <clears throat> so can I just say it and we work on it from there?" And sometimes it is really like raw. It, but it's one-on-one -on -one, and I'm okay with that kind of communication one-on-one -on -one. and okay get it out let me know what it is that you're trying to communicate give me your frustrations and then let's polish it where it's still what we're saying kind and candid yeah my, my preference usually was may we both be honest with each other right and that's your permission right yes. that's the coming back to can I get permission from you and you now have permission from me? Yes. Thank you so much. You're Excellent welcome. Presentation. Thank you. 
other questions, yeah. thoughts? Yeah, we have time for another one or two. Anyone? <laughs> Fort Worth, do you have a question? It does, right? No. None here. Thanks, Steve. Okay, because uh, your microphone was open. I thought maybe somebody had something. All right, one last shot because we are over time, but uh, we've got almost everybody still on board. So we'll give it a, another shot here. Anybody else have a comment, question? All right then, um, we will thank uh, Jody for an excellent presentation. Uh, this is a very personal topic and I could tell the reason we had so many signups um, was that I think a lot of people really need help with this one, want help with it, want to do better. Um, and um, you certainly answered questions today and gave everybody a lot of food for thought. I actually think your last slide really sums it up. Yeah. Been, yeah. And that really got to what I was trying to say, but not very well a few minutes ago. Yeah. Uh, that's a great slide. So, Jody. Do you want me to read it real quick as we wrap up? Yeah, go right ahead. I'll give you the last word um, and thank you. Okay. So in ending, remember that when it comes to candor, it's really, really important that we, <clears throat> that we look at the impact of camber, candor. Believe me, this is one of my really, my favorite quotes, and it still relates back to Disney because Edwin Catmull um, also worked for the Disney Corporation. So the quote is, believe me, you don't want to be at a company where there is more candor in the hallways or the water cooler than in the rooms where the fundamental ideas or policies are being hashed out. It's oh, that really is important. So true. So true. All right, that's a high note on which to end. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the people that are being at the uh, 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time Seminar um, have a, a wonderful experience ahead of them. So, Jody, we'll give you a break. Uh, we'll thank you once again. And from Sue, Robin, and I at Anime Headquarters, we wish everyone a lovely weekend on the horizon. 